Matthew chapter 18. That's where we'll start. I have been preaching through a series through the book of Matthew. In the beginning, it was my intention to basically walk through some of Jesus' finer points on the statement that he makes early on in the book where he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I didn't know that in beginning that series it would lead into me going through the book of Matthew and, and finding that that is the theme of the whole book. Jesus seeking disciples to follow him with the intent of making them fishers of men. Too often these days we get that backwards. We, we, we see somebody come to the Lord Jesus and we just want to get them working. We just want to get them laboring, toiling, whether it's out there visiting with, preaching the gospel to, or, or, or getting in activities of soul winning, or whether that's getting them in the church and getting them cooking and cleaning and doing all sorts of things. We want to get them into the labor. But it seems that Jesus is actually indicating that we ought to first and foremost focus on following him and let him make us into the labor. Make him into us the fisher of men, somebody that catches men. So you can go back and you can see my series up on our YouTube channel. I can share that with you if you so desire. But where I'm going to pick this up is in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus begins to talk to here little children. Let me read Matthew 18, the first six verses. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them. What a shock that must have been to the disciples looking for. Who's the greatest? And this little, little pipsqueak, this little toddler, this little child walks up to Jesus' arms. He brings that child forward and sets him before them. In verse 3 it says, And said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of of heaven. Verse 4, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall receive one of such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now I taught on this with some depth previous, but here I just want to give you some key points there. Verse 4 it says, Whosoever shall humble himself as this child, the same shall be greatest. And so if you want to be greatest in the kingdom, you have to be least. If you want to be exalted in the kingdom, you have to be humble. The next point that you see here is that these little children that he's referring to are those that believe on him. Of course he's talking about that little child that he brought up to the front to show them. But that there was a picture. That there was a parable, if you will. That he was a representation of the Christian and those that have believed on him. And we can see that in other places. First John, he addresses to little children, little children, little children often. Look with me in Matthew chapter 19, continuing with that in mind. Matthew chapter 19 and in verse 13. Matthew 19 and verse 13. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. Now Jesus had just said that this little child was greatest in the kingdom of heaven, not just one chapter previous. Now I don't know how much time passed, but it seems these disciples, whatever it was, whether it was a few hours or a few days, they seem to have a short memory because they rebuke the little children for trying to crowd Jesus and come into his presence, even though Jesus had just finished saying these are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus, as he often does, takes their behaviors and begins to address them with a spiritual lesson. Now, of course, little children are those that had come to him to be touched by him. But Jesus wants to teach them a spiritual lesson in this because you see an example of the hardness of their heart. Jesus had to basically rebuke them for rebuking these children for coming to Christ. 
Verse 14, it says, Then Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. Suffer is a word that means allow, permit little children. Just put up with little children coming to me. Let it happen. Forbid them not to come. He says, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. What he's saying here is that the kingdom of heaven is made up of little children who are allowed to come to Jesus. Isn't that clear? Doesn't that make sense? Those that belong to the kingdom are as little children that were allowed to come to Jesus. And he says, suffer it. Let this happen. This is good. And I believe here he's showing them an outward picture of an inside truth that he wants to deal with in verse 15. There in verse 15, and he laid his hands on them and departed thence. This is what the children came for the end. They came that they could have hands laid upon them and prayers made for them. And so Jesus obliges. Jesus lets that happen. Jesus puts his hands on them and then carries away. Now, go with me, keeping your finger in Matthew chapter 19. Go with me to John chapter 10. The words of the Lord are spirit. They are truth. And if we're going to get anything spiritual that can help us, we need to go to the Bible. And so I like to turn my pages lots. I love that sound. John chapter 10, if you would, look with me in verse 22. John 10, verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou makest us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, if you were to just look back in that same chapter in verse 19, Jesus there said, I am the, verse 9, sorry. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You could look back in chapter 9 and verse 5 where the Bible says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. These, of course, being very famous I am statements that Jesus makes. On the heels of the most important one of all there in verse 58, it says, Jesus saith unto them, this is John 8 and verse 58, John 8 and verse 58, Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, of course, Jesus had just finished saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. He addresses Abraham because these are who the religious Pharisees love to attach themselves to. They love to associate themselves with Abraham. Oh, our father Abraham. We are fathers of Abraham. And don't we see that today as well, where there's many religions that like to associate themselves with Abraham as if that's some sort of sign of a mark. That's, sort of, that's a sign of, of who they associate with, and this is what makes them right. Jesus addresses that head on and said, he was glad to see my day. Well, that's strange because that was thousands of years before Christ walked this world. So what is Christ saying? Verse 57, the Jews therefore were obviously confused by this. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And so Jesus makes that statement. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That statement, I am, is Way back in Exodus, you'll find it, when Moses asked, Who shall I say is coming? Who shall I say sent me? I am hath sent me. So Jesus here is making himself equal with God. And the Jews knew it because verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so this statement, I am... Before Abraham, before Abraham was, I am, was the first time when Jesus said it plainly. And they understood because they went to kill him as a result of his words. Go back to, now, John chapter 10, John chapter 10, and look in verse 25. So right before that, in verse 24, the Jews asked, 
Tell us plainly if thou be the Christ. Well, it seems Jesus has already done that several times. And so he returns and responds to them. Jesus answered them, verse 25, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. And so Jesus here deals with the Jews directly. He says, ye are not of my sheep. Ye are not of the little children that have humbled themselves and come unto me. You're a different group. Those that are of his sheep, Jesus here says in the context, are those that believe in the works that he has done in the Father's name. And those very works bear witness of Jesus that he is the Christ. They're missing it. And they're asking for it plainly. Not only has he said it, he's shown it through his works, the works that he does in the Father's name. These works that bear witness of him. And I believe the greatest the greatest sign that Jesus is about to do, the greatest work that Jesus is about to do, is that you found in verse 11, and as he talks down when he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. He says, I lay down my life that I might take it again. Jesus is about to show them what a good shepherd does for his own sheep, for his own little children. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now look at this in verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Very important here, Jesus is addressing a gift that's being given. He says, my sheep know me, I give unto them eternal life. Very clearly, Jesus isn't saying, I pay them eternal life. He's saying, I give it to them. That means there's no reciprocating exchange. They don't have to give their works. They don't have to give their money. They don't have to give their time and effort in exchange for eternal life. No, Jesus is the giver. He gives unto them eternal life. And not only that, it says very clearly, they shall never perish. What does eternal life mean? It means you will never perish. Once you have that life, once you've received it, given to you by Jesus Christ, you'll never perish. And it says that at the end of that verse, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now this is the same Jesus that we've seen do many wonderful miracles. This is the same Jesus that we just saw walked through the midst of, of an angry group of Pharisees that was trying to kill them. Can you imagine that for a moment? You have a horde of people that are trying to stone you with stones, and you just take a stroll through them, pass through the midst. That's what Jesus did. That's a miracle in and of itself. Never mind the healings. Never mind the miracles of, of, uh, of, of all sorts of things that Jesus has done. Healing the sick, making the lame to walk, making the blind to see, and so forth. Our Savior had done many wonderful things, and here he says that he has a miracle ready for his sheep, and that is, they will never perish, neither shall they ever be plucked out of his hand. Isn't that a wonderful thing, to be in the hand of Jesus, knowing all that he has done according to the scriptures? But it doesn't end there. Not only are you as his sheep secure in his hand, look at verse 29. My Father which gave them me... It's greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So here Jesus yields himself and humbles himself beneath the Father he just proclaims to be equal unto when he says, I am before Abraham was. Jesus here says that my Father is greater than all and no man is able to pluck the sheep that have received eternal life out of his hand. That means that greater than all Father and that wonderful Savior God in the flesh manifest here on earth for us to behold. 
both have the saved individual securely in their hand. And then in verse 30, even though Jesus had just said the Father is greater than all, he says in verse 30, I and my Father are one. Verse 31, and the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So they understood what he was saying. He was claiming to be equal to God. He was claiming to be God there manifest very clearly in the flesh. Before them standing there, the great I am that thundered from the mount proclaiming the 12 commandments was there standing in their presence. The very word of God was there in their presence. And he says, my father is greater than all. And if you can't be taken out of my hand, what chance do you have being taken out of the father's hand? He's offering them security here. I'm talking today about follow me. And the next lesson Jesus is talking about is how to follow him perfect. And being perfect. Okay? So, go back to Matthew chapter 19. Go down to Matthew chapter 19, where we started. We have in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 31... No, I just want you to turn there. These sheep were given eternal life, meaning they would never perish, meaning they would have life that never end. They are doubly held by Jesus and the Father that is greater than all. These are perfect. These are complete, as Colossians says in verse 2 and 10. Chapter 2 and verse 10, ye are complete in him. Now in Matthew 19 and verse 16 we have a case in point arrives. Throughout the teachings of Matthew, we found that Jesus either took someone that approached and used them then as a spiritual lesson, or as he often would do, I think he arranged divinely so that someone would come up to the disciples so he could use them as a spiritual lesson. And for whatever reason, I believe it's, it's God's perf perfect control and, 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 and manipulation of the world around. His timing is perfect. He is in control of all. At this time, someone comes up. In verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Quick question. Do good things? And does doing good give you eternal life? That's not a trick question. The answer is no, very clearly. Our works have nothing to do with our receiving of salvation. If I have to do good things, then it's not a gift that Christ is trying to bestow upon me. God wants to give you eternal life so that you'll never perish. Then he ensures that no man will ever pluck you out of his hands and the Father's hands. And so this man comes and he says, well, what good thing must I do? And we all know the answer because we've all read the scriptures. The Bible says, by grace are ye saved. And that's a gift. By grace are ye saved through faith. That not of yourselves. In other words, it's not through doing good things. It's not through your efforts. It's not through, through what you can give in order to appease God. Now, that's how the heathen gods work. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. And isn't that what we do when we do a good thing? We want to boast in it. We want to talk about how great we are for having achieved some things. And God says you'll never stand in his presence boasting over your good works. Everybody has to come as the little child. Everyone has to come humble before God and seek to be blessed of him. Another verse, I give unto them eternal life. We read that, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. That's a gift. It says also in Titus, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Mercy is, is something that you receive and you don't deserve. If I'm speeding down the road and the police officer catches me speeding and I was going 300 kilometers an hour, exaggerating now. I deserve the ticket. I deserve the punishment. I deserve the penalty. If he says, you know what? I'm letting you go. 
That's him being merciful. That's him extending a gift that I do not deserve. That's mercy. And we're not saved by our good works, but we're saved by his mercy and according to it. Continuing on in Matthew chapter 19, let's look at verse 17, the first part of that. And he said unto him, Jesus now addressing this man that has walked up, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Now Jesus has made it very clearly, and the religious knew that Jesus was proclaiming, I am God. He would said it many times throughout his ministry, and they knew it because of their response. You can see they, they sought to stone him for the blasphemy that he has made. Nevertheless, Jesus is dealing with this man in particular, and he says, Why are you calling me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Verse 17, in the second part of it, he says, But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So this man comes in and says, What good things should I do? And Jesus basically says, All of them. Keep the commandments. Be good. Though he's already said there's none good but one, and that is God. Nevertheless, he's working with this man and trying to teach him something about eternal life and, and the freeness of it, the gift that it is. He's also trying to teach his disciples that are there present of a truth. Keep the commandments. Verse 18, he saith unto him, which... Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Well, Christ says in other places, regarding murder, he says, He that hateth his brother is a murderer in his heart. He says of adultery, He that looketh upon a woman with lust hath committed adultery with her in his heart. He's now addressing stealing. He says, don't steal. Well, even some little thing? What about when you were a, a child and you, you snuck an extra cookie? Or what about when you're a little bit older and you, you take a pencil home from the office? He says, bear no false witness. Well, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. And when I'm dealing with somebody and their personal sin, their position of being a sinner before God. I love to take them to Revelation where it says, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. But people often say, oh, it's not, I'm not that bad. I, I've told some little white lies. Well, God further clarifies and it says that whoso loveth and maketh a lie will be the one that has their part in that burning, firing torment forever and ever and ever. Jesus is trying to prove to him that he's not good. He has already said there's none good but one, and that is God. And now he's showing him, well, keep the commandments. Verse 19, it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Keeping your finger there in Matthew, go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. This is what Jesus is trying to show to this man. He's trying to demonstrate to him he is not good as he thinks he is. He is lost, though he thinks he's achieving salvation. He's going to make it. Just give me that one good thing that I must do. Tell me, Jesus, what's the good thing that I have to do that I may inherit eternal life? In James chapter 2, that's after the book of Hebrews, a little later in your Bible, before Revelation, Jude, and the Johns, James chapter 2 in verse 8, the Bible says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And so maybe this, this man was thinking to himself, Okay, I, I, I can love my neighbor as myself, and then I'll do well, and then God will accept me. But look at verse 9. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. In other words, you're convicted by the law as a transgressor. Ye commit sin if you have respect of persons. But wait, I do well by loving my neighbor. Ah, but if you have respect of persons, you do sin. So what's he teaching here? Well, respect of persons, back in verse 2. What is that? James 2, verse 2. For if there come unto your assembly... 
Now picture yourself here for a moment. If there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place. And say unto the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? In other words, your judgment is full of evil thoughts. What is he saying here? Well, a man came to you today, and he came with a coat, he came with a tie, he came showered, he came wearing a, wearing a ring. And you welcome him, and you invite him in, and you give him the chiefest seat in the building, and you, and you, you, you rejoice to see him, and you shake his hands. But if at the same time, this same man came in, dirty clothes, all torn up, smelling, beard down to here, unclean, the dirt caked under my fingernails, stink, stench, and you say, ooh, let's sit back here. It's called respect of persons. It's called having a judgment full of evil thoughts. The Bible says that no matter how much you love your neighbor, if you act that way and are partial, you're going to judge this man according to his garments and judge this man differently according to his garments, you do sin. And this is what he's trying to teach us here in James. Verse 10, the whole point of this all, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law... And yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. In other words, you keep all the commandments, but you steal a pencil from the office. You keep all the commandments, but you tell a fib in order to get out of trouble. You keep all the commandments. You love your neighbor, but you have respect of persons and treat people differently according to their position, according to their apparel, according to um, their family, perhaps, according to their nationality. You treat people different. You have respect of persons. You're guilty of all the law. In other words, God will throw at you the punishment due the murderer, the punishment due the fornicator, the punishment due the adulterer, in the same fashion as he will throw the punishment of the petty theft, the liar. If you offend in one point, you're guilty of them all, very clearly in the scriptures. Verse 11 says, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now this is what Jesus is trying to teach. is the same thing James is proclaiming here. If you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. In other words, no matter how good you think you are, you're not good in the sight of God. You've sinned. You are a sinner. Now Jesus, and it's, all, it's interesting because James here in the same context is actually dealing with rich people. He just talked about the man coming in in goodly apparel, wearing that, that gay clothing, the bright clothing, the clean clothing, the, the, the respectable clothing according to the world. And he was also talking about the poor man that was in vile or filthy raiment. In verse 5 it says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do they not blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? James here is basically explaining that while you may judge the man goodly for his outward appearance and give him a chief seat, He's often the one that has the greatest of sins in his life, oppression towards the poor, hurting and harming people, bringing them to the judgment seats, blaspheming in the name of God. And yet this poor man in revile raiment, because he's humble, because he came as a little child, that poor man comes and he's rich in the eyes of God for the faith that he has. Go back to Matthew chapter 19. We'll bring this together. Matthew chapter 19. Because remember in Matthew 19 we're dealing with a man that comes and he says, What good thing must I do? And basically the answer of God towards him is, Well, it doesn't matter because if you've even committed one 
Little sin, you're guilty of all. One little trespass of God's commandments, you're judged a sinner before him and worthy of, worthy of the condemnation and the punishment due to sinners in the eyes of an angry and holy God. So back there in James chapter, or sorry, Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 20. It says, The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. Do you know what he's saying? I haven't sinned. I'm good. From my youth up, I have kept all these commandments. Impossible. But he asked Jesus, What lack I yet? Well, Jesus just said, Keep the commandments. And you'll have life. He says, I, I've done it all, but what am I lacking? What was he missing? Seemingly, he knew he was missing something. So he asked Jesus, what am I missing? What lack I yet? Well, I would say Jesus is dealing with this man and his lack of what he just talked about regarding the little children. This man is missing, he's lacking Jesus' hands on him. As the little child that enters into the kingdom. He's missing that assurance of the salvation of God. That surety that I have eternal life. And I am never going to perish. And I am in Jesus' hands. But greater than that, I am in the Father's hands. Else why would he ask the question? Do you know what question I never ask? What am I lacking? What do I need to do to go to heaven? What do I need to do to have eternal life? I never ask that question. Why? Because I have assurance that I have eternal life and I shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck me out of Jesus' hands, let alone the Father who is greater than all. I have that assurance and this is what this man is lacking. He is lacking Christ's hands upon him. He's imperfect. He's incomplete. He is poor in faith, even as the Bible promises, rich men will be. Remember, he talked about how the poor are rich in faith, and he talked about how the rich are, I believe by extension, poor in faith. And then they get caught up into sins like blasphemy. They get caught up into sins like taking advantage of the poor and all sorts of other things. Here he's lying to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, I've, committed, I've, I've kept all of these commandments. Does anyone believe for a moment that he's, he's never stolen anything? He's never told a lie even once? No. Little children lie. You don't have to teach them that. It's in them, isn't it? My brother did it. <laughs> Verse 21. In answering the question, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect... Go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be complete, become poor. When you become poor, you become those that are rich in faith. He says to him, give up your earthly treasure, and gain treasure in heaven, and then follow me. He's saying to this man, if you will be perfect, be faithful. If you will be perfect, give up what you're trusting in and trust in Jesus. Become poor and thereby rich in faith. And this is good news to any of us who have thought long about this and about our stance before God. It's a daunting task to try to keep all the commandments. Didn't Jesus just tell the man, if you will enter into life, do the impossible. Keep all the commandments. If you want to enter into life, keep every one of them. Not only the ten, but the subsequent ones in the Bible. Keep all the commandments. If thou will enter into life, that's impossible. And so Jesus here offers good news. Well, if you will be perfect, then go and sell that thou hast. What you've got get rid of it. Give up your temporal in order to get hold of eternal and follow Jesus thereafter. But this man didn't receive the good news as Christ was trying to give it to him. Verse 22 it says, But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great 
possessions. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, it's not because of the possessions that he is sorrowful, because there's many good men of God in the scriptures that had lots, and yet were men of faith. Solomon, for example. But this rich man, this young man, had put his trust in his possessions and the security that they offer and the stability that they offer. He was fully self-reliant. And so what need had he to trust in anyone, let alone Jesus? He had no need for faith. And this is the trap that the rich always get caught into. We know it in ourselves when we start to trust in a little bit of the bank as we start to build it up. And we're like, wow, I'm confident. I got this. You start to walk further away from God. But as trials enter in, as poverty starts to enter in, as tribulations enter in, now you're drawing closer to God. You're richer in faith when you are poor, when you are humble, when you're as a little child in the kingdom of heaven. Be perfect? Well, Jesus says to him, give up what you have. Receive his treasure and follow him. I'm going to go to one more place. Philippians. Keep your finger in Matthew. I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Faith is one of the easiest things for a believer to walk in. Because it requires no effort on our part. We're simply trusting the Lord. But our problem is we're so full of pride, we're so full of self-reliance, we're, we're so full of that thing in us that wants to work, wants to achieve, wants to strive, that, that we put off having faith and we start to rely on ourselves. Faith is easy, but it's hard for us to, to get into believing and trusting and, and showing faith towards our Savior. There in Philippians chapter 3, look at verse 6, the second half of it. Verse 6 as a whole. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So here, the Apostle Paul says that according to the law, I am blameless. Continuing down, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Does the Apostle Paul sound like he regrets his decision to count all things but dung, suffer loss, that he could grab hold of the excellency which is in Christ? I don't think he regrets it even for one moment. But the Apostle Paul was as this rich man, and he said... Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. He said, touching the righteousness which is by the law, I'm blameless. Even as the man over in Matthew chapter 19 had said, all these have I kept from my youth up. I'm blameless in these scriptures. I'm blameless in these commandments. But the apostle Paul knew better, and this is what Jesus wanted for that rich man. He wanted him to become poor in order that he would be rich and have the excellency of the knowledge of of Christ Jesus my Lord. Look, the Apostle Paul reckoned everything that he had that was gain to be but dung in comparison to the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord. He desired to win Christ and be found in him, look verse 9, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. To the rich man, gain is gain. They presume that gain is godliness, but the poor know better. It's faith. It's knowing Christ. It's winning Christ that is the ultimate gain to any man. And back there in Matthew chapter 19, go there. He said he had his own righteousness. He said that he was blameless concerning the law. But what he is missing was the righteousness which is of God by faith. And if you don't have God's righteousness, you have nothing at all. What lack I yet? 
The righteousness which is of God by faith. The gift of God which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what he lacked. He lacks Jesus' hands upon him and that eternal security of being in the Lord's hands and in the Father's hands as well. This is what that rich man lacked. Though he seemed like a good believer, didn't he? He thought he was keeping the law. He thought he was blameless. Maybe he did walk and live a very good life. But if he stands before God having only his own righteousness, which is of the law, he stands before God condemned a sinner, as do any man, woman, child, as does any man, woman, and child that stands before God in their own righteousnesses. Matthew 19 and verse 23 Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of God. Hardly means it's difficult. It's challenge. It's rare that a rich man should enter in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think that's a metaphor. I think that's talking about an actual camel trying to go through a needle's head. That's hard. That's difficult. That, I would say, is impossible. And that's how the disciples received that statement. Verse 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Who can be saved? It's harder, it's easier for a, rich, or for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom? Wow. That's amazing. Who can be saved if that's the case? Who's going to go into the kingdom if that's the case? Well, the answer is the little child who's humble. He says, want to be humbled? Want to come to to God in the right position? With the right attitude? With the right spirit? Come to God empty and ask the Lord to make you full. That's what he says to this rich man. He says, Go sell what you have. Go sell what you're offering. Go sell what you're trusting and get rid of that and come and follow me. Give up what you have. Become poor. Become faithful. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. I think if you look back there in verse 16, he makes this statement. Behold, One came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says in verse 9 there, Lest any man should boast. We don't come with our works, lest any man should boast. And doesn't this man's statement just reek of boasting? He comes, he stands before Jesus, Good master, what good thing should I do that I may enter in to eternal life, that I may have eternal life. He says, all these commandments have I kept from my use. What lack I yet? Verse 25, his disciples were amazed, and Jesus said, it's impossible for that man to come. It's impossible for him to enter into the kingdom of God. And they said, wow, who can be saved? Verse 26, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, All things are possible. What's he saying here in the context? With God, it's possible to keep the commandments. Wow. With God, it's possible to have eternal life. With God, it's possible to be, as verse 21 says, perfect. With God, it's possible to follow Jesus. But it's only with God. Not by the good things that we have done, but by believing in the good one. Not by the good things which we have done, but by believing in the good one. There's none good but one, that's God. Jesus Christ said, I am God. Trust him. Believe on him. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? 
He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Having faith in Christ, trusting Christ is the only way to have salvation, to have life, and to have life more abundantly. You come to God humble, and you ask him. I think a better statement for this rich man would be not saying, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? If I was to rephrase his words and send him to Christ with another statement, it would be, Jesus, I have nothing. Jesus, may I have eternal life? Jesus, I want to follow you. Good master. It's almost the whole thing backwards. And like I said, when it comes to following Jesus and being made a laborer, being made a worker, being made a fisher of men, our world gets it backwards. We want to do all of the Christian things. We want to behave like Christians first in order to prove that we're following Jesus. It's backwards. You come to Jesus humbly with nothing. You trust in Jesus with all of your being and say, give me eternal life that I would never perish. And then you decide from then on to follow Jesus and you make the decision to walk in the newness of life that he gives you and that's putting things in the right order. This man says, I'm going to follow you. What should I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus says, come to me with nothing. Receive eternal life and then follow me. Come to me with nothing. Take this gift And then follow me, and I will make you the one that does good things. I will do good things through you. This is what Jesus Christ is teaching. And so if I was to say then to anybody that wanted to come to Christ today and ask them the question, I wouldn't say, hey, go to Jesus right now and ask him how many good things you have to do. And then whatever he says, go and do it. No, 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 no. Do you know what Jesus would do? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Because in Matthew chapter 7, there's a group that came to Jesus and said, I've done this, I've done that, in thy name, I have done many wonderful works. And Jesus says, depart from me, you works of iniquity, I never knew you. And that's the exact same thing he's going to say to this rich man when he comes to him and says, what good things shall I do? I've done them all. Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. The way you come to Christ is as a little child. You come and say, I have nothing Lord, give me everything. I have nothing. Give me life. I'm dead. Give me everlasting, eternal life. Lord, put your hands upon me and take hold of me. Lord, have your Father take a hold of you as as you hold me so that I will never perish. I will never be plucked out of your hand. Give me eternal life. And then Jesus starts to lead you in the way that you ought to live that eternal life that he gave you. But yet so many of us go to God and say, I'm good. I'm pretty good. We need to remember that the only one good is God, the good shepherd that gave his life for the sheep. And when he gave his life for his sheep, he did all the good works. When he died on that cross, when he shed his precious blood, when he suffered the pains of death, to be left in a tomb for three days and three nights, when he rose again triumphantly to justify us. Jesus Christ did all the works. There's nothing you can do to stand before him with any type of assurance of your salvation. Your assurance comes from the fact that you have received the gift of life and you know you'll never perish. You know You're safe in Jesus' hands, and you're safe in the Father's hands. And that's how you know that you're perfect, complete in him, is because he is your justification. No one's going to stand before God with any sin on them. They must stand before God in his beloved Son, who gave himself to be the Savior of the world. John 3.16 is the most famous verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when you have life that never ends and when you're promised by the God that never lies, 
that you're safe in his hands, you can rest assured you're on your way to glory. And you'll never have to ask God, as this man did, what good thing do I have to do? You'll instead ask God, Lord, what good thing can I do to glorify you? To show your love. To show my appreciation for you saving me. Lord, help me to do good things. It's a different attitude. Faith first. Faith always. It's a Christian walk. We believe. And we believe. 1 John 5.13